Eh, buenas tardes y buenas noches. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it is my pleasure to extend welcome to our panelists, our artist, uh, Julia Santos Salomon, the co-founding member uh, of the Altos de Chabón School, uh, Sherezade Garcia, co-founder of the Dominican York Proyecto Gráfica, uh, Dulcina Abreu, independent curator, artist, and museum advocate. Um, and also thank you to my colleagues and co-organizers of this roundtable, uh, Sharina Mayo Pozo, an assistant professor of Romance Languages at the University of Georgia, uh, and Rachel Afi Quinn, who is an assistant professor in comparative cultural studies and the women's gender and sexuality studies at the University of Houston. Uh, my name is Elena Valdez. I'm a professor of Spanish at Christopher Newport University in Virginia. We had a small mistake in the program initially where the name of Julia Santos Salomon was not listed there. We apologize. It is now has been fixed and Julia was with us since the very beginning, since the moment we submitted the proposal for this panel. We interviewed her and now she's here with us. And thank you uh, to all. So uh, the first part of this roundtable took place yesterday when we showed the interviews that each of us conducted with our artists. And uh, today, first, we would like to explain briefly why we decided to organize this roundtable. And then we will move to the questions that we have prepared for Julia, Sherizad, and Dulcina. And at the end, time permitting, we will open the floor to questions uh, from, uh, from the audience. So um, um, I will start. And um, I first became interested in the Altos de Chavon School of Arts and Design while writing an article about Dominican women artists, Las Chaboneras, Belkis Ramirez, and Raquel Payewonski. And since then, I have been thinking about the school's legacy and impact over multiple generations of Dominican and Latinx artists. And on the one hand, it has been known for its innovative pedagogical strategies and the formation of, of a new aesthetic, especially in contrast to a more traditional education in the Escuela Nacional de Bellas Artes. On the other hand, since the moment of its founding in 1980s by American billionaire, the school built that bridge between the Dominican Republic and its diaspora in New York City that also went beyond the establishment of uh, the Altos de Chabon, Chabon Alumni Association in uh, Parsons in um, 1990, and informed the unique education received by the Chaboneras, as well as their transnational artistic trajectory and Dominican York identities we uh, all explore in this roundtable. That is why I chose to interview Julia Santos Salomon, a co-founding faculty member of Chavon, um, who offered her personal knowledge about the school's history and its importance across different generations. At the same time, as a professor of Caribbean studies with a focus on gender and sexuality, I explore the role that mothering and motherhood play in, in culture, in Dominican culture. So in addition to the representation of women's experiences and strong matriarchal household ties reflected in Julia's work, I'm interested in seeing how these matrilineal roles are transferred to the mentorship uh, among Chavoneras. Specifically, many founding members were women artists and influenced future generations of female Dominican Lat and Latino artists who in turn returned to school to mentor future generations as it, it happens now with Raquel Payewonski, a Chabonera who leads the fine arts department at Chabon. Thank you and uh, paso la palabra a Sharina. Sí, bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, mi viaje por el trabajo de Cherezade tiene mucho que ver con lo personal, así que empezaré un poco con unas cuestiones autoetnográficas, ¿no? Uh, the first time I heard the word Dominican York was in 1986, when I was six years old. I remember it vividly because he was referring to my son, to my soon-to-be uncle, Tio Pache, a barbu with a curly, a swagger, and a New York Dominican accent that stole the heart of my aunt and ultimately stole my aunt from me. The infamous story of my running away from the church where they were getting married while still holding the tail of her white dress still haunts me at every family gathering. My reasons for such tantrum are still debated, but now at age 40, 
I realized that instead of saying the dreaded I oppose this union, six-year-old me simply decided to run away from a reality that will soon fragment the only side of my family that was still somehow together. Shortly after the big celebration, Tia took a direct flight to New York City via Pan Am, or in other words, el Dominican Yol se la llevó. Four years later, my tia brought my abuela to Los Países, and in 1989, at age nine, my circular migration cycle began. Reflecting upon my constant by Venice between the borderlands of New York and Santo Domingo, I, a self-identified Dominican girl currently living in the U.S. South, who is still trying to assume my constant crossings, inhabitings, and bridgings of the borderlands between the U.S. and the DR, not as fragmentations or loss, but as a redemptory and unifying condition. As such, relying on individual and collective sonic, literary, and artistic archives has become vital to conceptualize my transnational and borderless embodiment of Dominicanidad. Focusing in the works of Cheresa de Garcia has been a conscious act to piece together and recover parts of my individual and collective identities that were somehow lost in the rush of packing and unpacking every with every return and departure. It is also a way to dialogue with other areas of my scholarly work that established transnational connections between the DR and New York. Looking at her work opens a space of reckoning and acknowledging las heridas abiertas that remain in the bodies and experiences of Dominican migrants in the borderlands between two islands, Hispaniola and Manhattan. I first encountered Cheresada's work in 2010 when I was pursuing my doctoral degree and I acquired my first piece by her, La Isla Reves, which is right here. It's been with me for, is, this is the 10th year that I have that. So wow. our anniversary, Cheresa. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So my upside down island. Cheresa arrived at 34th and 5th Avenue to hand deliver the piece herself. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, meeting her was one of those turning points that took me out of my comfort zone of Dominican, Dominican your literary studies and popular culture and immersed me into visual arts by Dominican your artists, in particular, the works of Cheresade at Semino Chabonera in New York City, a visual storyteller whose narratives became a gateway or have become, let me, let, me ref, let me correct myself there, have become, because they're still happening, a gateway in worlds where many of the layers that shape Dominican, Caribbean, Latinx identities collide to create, in the words of Cheresade herself, and I quote, allegories of history, colonization, politics, and that. She's a visual alchemist, who is constantly transforming objects and symbols to create alternative collective histories and allegorical narratives. The ambivalent and very busy waters of the Atlantic and the Caribbean become at times a frontera liquida. That's a term that she uses. It is also conceptualized as a metaphor of the often anxiety-driven and terrifying idea of transplanting oneself from the homeland to the US. Many of Cheresades' work reflect on immigration, its losses and, it gain, and its gains, the transformations of subjects with historical intergenerational translocations and constants by Venice, like the one that started when I was six years old, no? and all of that I was saying. As such, the Dominican York becomes central in her work a hybrid subjectivity that is constantly transiting the liquid highway of the Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean. Thank you so much, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Shalina, for that. I'm also really excited to be here. It's actually my first Dominican Studies Association conference and first digital conference in this form. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I've written a little bit as well by way of introduction. I'm equally passionate about the arts and African diaspora art. So it's so fun to be, to get to talk about this. Um, I've been particularly interested in cultural productions 
um, by Dominican women and what their influences are. And I have a first book coming out called Being La Dominicana, Race and Visual Culture in Santo Domingo that you can have in your hands in June from University of Illinois Press. And it explores some of these interests, but also in relationship to of course, Dominican racial schemas, but also thinking about surrealist tendencies in art and many other things. Um, my transnational feminist cultural studies research is primarily focused on Dominican women's identities and experiences of race and gender in Santo Domingo. However, questions about the influence of Altos de Chabon, the <laughs> art school, and its connections with Parsons School of Art and Design have led me to look at reformations of identity in the diaspora. And I'm um, particularly interested in like which students have had access to the schools that are on the island as well. So we might get to talk about that today. Uh, included in my first book is an interview that I had in two, uh, in, conducted in 2010 with Dulcina Abreu, a young Dulcina. <laughs> and um, I was living in Santo Domingo and I got to talk with Dulcina and also her friend, Michelle Ricardo, who is in a panel after this one. Um, artists who had studied at Altos de Chabon. And um, they had many great insights that inform my work and interpretations of race and gender in the Dominican Republic. And their theorizations of their own experiences on the island were really invaluable to me at the core of the ways that I've analyzed and thought about Dominican identity as a non-Dominican you know, over the years. So uh, in April la of last year, I had a brief visit to Santo Domingo and Michelle actually took me to see the campus of Chabon. And it had before seeing it really become quite a mythical place in the ways that people talked about it. And so going to see this space on the river and the construction, you know, and also being able to feel this energy of the space that Dulcina talks about um, was really powerful for me and kind of keeps me rooted in thinking about what this project could become. Um, and so I've been talking with Sharina and Elena over the last couple of years now and had the opportunity to meet Julia and Sheherezade in the last couple of years and, and sort of plant seeds around how might we work together. So that, um, that kind of collaboration, feminist collaboration actually really energizes me. And um, the interviews we conducted were just happened in the last week or so. So it's really a beginning. Um, but my passion is like trying to understand how people are theorizing their lives and what we see in these conversations are the ways that we have to produce our own language to articulate these experiences. And even as Dulcina says, like one has to create one's own world to make sense of what it feels like to, to experience the transnational and all of these intersections. So um, additionally, these interviews we've conducted uh, have me thinking about matriarchal families and influences on artists, as well as what becomes more of a zigzag across generations in terms of migration, a back and forth. Um, and I love this frontera liquida that we can talk about. Um, but I see this really as just the beginning of a project and um, I'm eager to get to know kind of the broader genealogy, the connections, how people are mentoring one another and what the existing archive is for Los Chaboneros, what the Facebook group looks like and what conversations are happening there, um, how we might use oral history te um, techniques and also digital humanities tools to map um, influences and connections and um, think in terms of curation and archiving that I've been started talking with Dulcina about in her own work and expertise and also like what the different visions are across generations of Chaboneras. So um, I will just end with that. Oh, I just wanted to mention that, you know, this first round of interviews we did, we did them in English. Um, and I don't know that we actually like came to an agreement about why or how we would do that. But I, I hope and I assume that we'll do some of these interviews in Spanish as well and a mix and, and draw on different memories and different experiences and influences. So just in terms of thinking about how we do kind of oral history and ethnographic work. And then uh, for me, and I think one of the goals we've been brainstorming is ways that we might publish together 
work collaboratively, think about what we can build online for timelines. So today in this space that in the time that we've tried to protect here, what we would like to do is have a conversation where um, Sharina, Elena and I have, you know, three questions we'd like to pose to each of the artists or esteemed artists that we have invited. Um, and then we'll open up so that the audience can have a chance to get in there. And certainly we have many more questions, but I think we have a good chunk of time and we already know that our artists and guests have rich um, in information and archives to share with us. So with that and some, a little bit of nervous energy, but so much enthusiasm and like respect for each of you and the work that you bring, I'll, I'll pass it back over to Elena and we could get started with the conversation. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so just to clarify, uh, we will ask you um, all the same question. Please take approximately three minutes to answer it, and uh, I will keep uh, track of time and we'll let you know when, uh, when one minute is left, so I will constantly interrupt you. I apologize for that in advance. So the first question um, is actually about the topic that interests me. In, in each of your interviews, you spoke about the role of your family, especially grandmothers that played in your formation as an artist. Can you please expand on this? Whoever wants to answer first. Maybe I can start because actually like she's with me right now too. Um, so yeah, um, I love that Rachel started to like talk about how like this like my matriarchal society is like we're nurturing each one of us and serving as inspiration to like continue like creating platforms for mentor mentorship and understanding that like this relationship like that we have with family members like through blood as well as like um, the relationship that we have like with all our colleagues in Chabon. I wanted to share a little bit like what we were seeing when I was what well, at least when I was like at school uh, that it was like very um, maybe like you you can see it now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so what we were having is truly a family. Mm -hmm. uh, we were cooking together, we were living together, uh, we have like different people that as a family member, like a, as a whole family, maybe at one point don't have like economic support to cook for their own and go to the grandmother house in order to be able to sustain uh, their own like family tree. So I think um, Chabon was like immense like teaching situation for me because being far away from my family uh, helped me to understand that that was an experience that I would like me to pursue in another country, in another uh, uh, aspect of even like working with artists as well. My grandmother, it was, um, um, a person like migrating since bef before like her she was born because like she had like lineage of like Spanish and like Gitana también so like then like she like was like I'm migrating from El Campo the countryside Santiago to the city Santo Domingo and then like migrating like because of like, like Okay, work shortage like from Santo Domingo to Nueva York to trabajar como doméstica to work wow. as a domestic laborer. But at the same time, having this like Sunday best that it was like per like portrayed in like the pictures that she was like sending back to the family. So I think like grandmother, my grandmother, uh, is muy importante is my muse. Because like you have like these people that are like iconic and create and community builders, and that like are going to like be permitting you and inspiring you to continue doing that. Not only in your work, but as well in your uh, philosophy and as a person. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect timing. <laughs> Julia, share that, por favor, please. Um, well, thank, first, thank you for the invitation. What a pleasure, what an honor to be with these brilliant women. You know, this is like a heaven, actually. <laughs> thank you. Um, I am definitely um, very influenced by my mother. 
my grandmothers, my great aunts, my aunts. That also funny thing to say has allowed me to have a wonderful relationship with men, by the way, because uh, makes me very assertive in the things I want and I won't, and the things I won't take, you know, which is something that can be a chapter of conversation. But um, I, um, I, I came from a family where women were very powerful and they were different. And, um, and I fought a lot sometimes about feeling that sometimes I was weird, but then I was lucky enough, you know, to have the mother and the grandmothers that would say to me, it is okay to be different, you know, because of course we all want to belong, but I was a little bit different always in, in a way. And that was very difficult when I was a little. And then later on, you know, but I was, I was a funny part is that I was very popular <laughs> because I am very social. So people think because I am very social, you know, it's like that's popularity. But really, I, well, I, I can be like such a lonely person because I need to be and live in myself. But the presence of my mother the, and my grandmother where books were important, information were important, to find my own voice were important, where like, you know, she decided wants to go to the moon. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And that, that was super important. And that helped me a lot when I actually decided to come to, um, actually first to go to a North American school. I was, um, you know, I, I was lucky as, as, as a young kid, I was able to travel and I went to Europe. So the first thing I thought when I was going to finish a school was like I was going to study uh, in Europe, Italy or Spain, you know, family connections will be perfect over there. But, um, but then I, I, I fell for the presentation by Leopoldo Mahler uh, that was uh, that was the first rector, uh, the, the dean, the first dean of Chabon. Yes, uh, thank you. And then you know over there, I um, when I decided to stay, you know, it was respected like that. And when I got, I, I you know, I, I was awarded the scholarship to come to New York. Then and then when I love New York, when I don't supposed to love New York because it's you know it's North America. What is that? You know. And all of a sudden, I became double. You know, all that support and, and uh, from my mother and my grandmother and the way that, that I was supposed to be assertive came very handy. Gracias, uh, Julia. Um, for the last 10 years, I've been working on a body of work called The Family Narrative. Yeah. And it involves sculpting the busts of four generations of the women in my family. And the reason I am doing this work is because these are the women who formed me. And each one of them had an important role in our migration story. You know, my Aunt Tomasa, who came to the States at age 18. My mother, who came when I was four. And my grandmother, who stayed behind to raise me. What was remarkable about my grandmother, who is the first person I will speak of, is that she claimed me when I was born because I was born into a family that was grieving. My grandfather had been killed three months before my birth um, and it left the family literally without a patriarch, which created this extraordinary network of incredibly strong women. And my grandmother, was not an educated woman, but she had the will of five men. And she managed somehow to keep our family together, even though we were in two different countries. And that will allowed us to survive all kinds of trauma. I went back to Dominican Republic. I came to the States to visit mom when I was six. And I turned seven in New York. And I went to first grade. And when we returned, when our visa was over, we came straight into the war, the 1965 war. And I cannot, you don't have enough time for me to describe what that was. Running, hiding, shooting, being under the bed. Um, bazookas, dead people in the streets. It was, my grandmother got us out of Santo Domingo into Santiago, 
found a way for us to survive. And she kept this family. She was like, she said something, it happened. My mother was raised way too independently for a woman in the 50s. My mother was raised like a son. My grandfather made sure that she ran and she swam and she played baseball and she didn't fit in. She did not fit in in the Dominican Republic. So mom had this extraordinary struggle. She was very beautiful and that was a problem for her. She was an athlete and she was happiest when she was sweating, right? And she was, she knew she needed to leave and she left and she traded all the things that were wonderful about her. She traded them all to become a factory worker so she could get papers for my grandmother and I to come to the United States. So I, I think about all of these women and how each one of them had a role. And I am doing this work for my nieces and nephews, the generation that grew up in New York, who think that the Dominican Republic is a postcard or a resort. They need to understand what was sacrificed in order for them to go to college and to do whatever they want. But I want them to know I am doing this work so they understand. They're standing on the shoulders of four generations of the women of women before them. So this work is highly personal and it's also become very public. There's one piece of myself at age four, which is the age when mom and Leah left and our family just that little sculpture, she's like an ambassador. She's been in a lot of shows. She's in the Hudson River Museum right now in a show called Women to the Fore. And she just draws people in. She's not a happy child. You can look at her and see how intense she is. She's got three moños. And she speaks to who I was, what that felt like, and what I want my grandchildren to understand. So it's celebrating those women who formed me. I turned out to be the observer, the hybrid. You know, I lived between the Dominican culture where I was born and the New York culture, you know, culture where I was raised. And I had to translate. Julia, thank, I apologize. Thank, I apologize for interrupting because we have time constraints. We need to go to the second questions. I really apologize. Uh, Sharina. Don't forget. Uh, um, we will have more time uh, towards the end of the session and everyone can develop on, um, mm -hmm. on what you have been saying. Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, Sharina, por favor. Okay. Um, referring back to the interviews, the three of you spoke briefly um, about the ways in which the mediums and materials you, show, you use become vehicles uh, to conceptualize and imagine a hyphenated and multidimensional identity as migrants, immigrant Dominicans. So if you could please elaborate on that, it would be great for us. Um, yeah, I can maybe like a story. And Elena, get the, get the time machine running. I'll try to do it quick. Okay, let me share a little bit my screen so you can see this. So like, let me know everybody if you're seeing this image. Okay, so I think like this transition of like working in Altos de Chabon with painting, I was primarily a painter, but like moving into the United States and seeing how like my body racialized was uh, connecting with a lot of labor in New York City, I started to like have like conversations with like the Dominicans that were uh, you utilizing the building where I was, uh, that I was like um, at school in Parsons. So many of the Dominicans that were there that were not chairs out there were janitors. So they were like uh, encargados of like paint everything to like create like these like transition in between one, uh, one uh, 
installation of each one of these artists into like a white space and then like the artists are were creating another installation and another so i was like very interested in that transition that labor that they were doing in creating like uh, kind of like even a translation from one work to another. So it started to like as well like talk about translation in between the Dominican Republic landscape and the New York landscape and my struggle with the language. So I started to like work with a skin between one. That it was a performance that I was like creating as a labor person, like pink, like dress up as a non-binary person, all in pink painting my nursery room in like a bright pink like you cannot see that now but it was like a weird color it was like bright and a light pink and then like I take off my clothes and I start to like make the clothes one minute good to me okay the painting so I was like trying to insert myself in between the latex that it was like painted in the room and the Chirac um, and with that one as well, like I continue like exploring how like fabrics have been impacted the Latinx history at large. Like for example, the one that is used in the border right now with the emergency blanket, how like these, uh, these emergency blankets are like very impregnated in our community at large. So I started to like create this like piece called Homeland that is like the American flag that like we can all can reflect on and we can move and see our bodies moving in front of it back and forth to talk about this like land of diaspora that is the United States and how like our imprint like it stays in it each time that we go back and forth. Okay. Thank you, gracias. Jared. Oh, Julia, Julia, your mic is on. Well, everywhere I go, I'm a Dominican. That is the first thing that I have to say. People say to me, don't you just want to be like a, a regular artist? I said, no, I'm a Dominican born American artist. So everywhere I go, uh, that goes with me. And all of my work, whether it's oil painting, sculpture, all of my work reflects where I come from. Um, my palette is a Dominican palette. I didn't get to it till I was about 19 years old and I was a student in, in Rome and that golden light in Italy just kind of opened up my vision and I came to the tropical colors. And that's the first thing. Everywhere you go, and everything I make is going to have a reference to the Dominican Republic. I feel very strongly that I'm female. I feel very strongly that I am Dominican and I have a 900 stories to tell. And um, every time I interact with my own people, there's humor and there's sadness and there's all kinds of raw material, which means something to me. I use it in my work. Um, I was doing very large contemporary gold leaf pieces. And these pieces are abstract, but every single one is tied to water Colon the colonizers, um, seashores, it, all of it, even if I'm seeing it from the sky, is tied to the Dominican Republic. The intention for me of using the gold leaf is to put back the gold that was stripped. One minute, one minute. Thank you. It was stripped from our land by Columbus. And we were powerless then, but I feel empowered as an artist. And my job is to put that gold back. So every large piece, every small piece that I make with gold leaf is tied to our history and my intention to correct and heal that. 
Gracias. Perfecto. Gracias. Sherezet, por favor. Um, well, my work is all about the politics of inclusion. It's all about really a love note to the Caribbean. And because I am a pirate, I, I go to say that I am pan-Caribbean, okay? I, I, I fall in love with everything that has to do with Caribbean. I understand that. That's why I get along with the New Yorkers because we live with these people from everywhere so we can understand each other. So I'm gonna go and share my screen to give you a little map of how you know this experience you know, have taken me, this double experience and this pirate spirit I have. Okay, can you see it, guys? Yes. Yes? So, when I came to New York, my world became very bright. And, and this was like a going back to the course that I used in Dominican Republic. That was 1996. I started hacking Europe beauty. And I started hacking the Euro European beauty with symbols that represented not Columbus, but the Spanish crown, the one to blame for the abuse. One minute, one minute. And then I, all the work I had done has taken me to take off, to tackle race. And that's why you're going to see that, that the idea of water, or say obstacle and a via, is all over there. Why? Because those waters, they carry our DNA, they carry our stories, and they carry also those pieces of the stories that have to be silenced. But they come afloat somehow. Then uh, the iconography of the Catholicism is always present. Even though my family is a Fardy Jew, West African and Protestant, <laughs> somehow we landed in a very Catholic colony <laughs> in the 1700s. And then uh, all my work talks about the politics of colors. In this case, the pink. When I want to talk about something serious, I use the color that in society tells you that is fragile, pink, women. So you know what, in my vocabulary, the pink is strong. So, and my angels are dark. Why? Not because they're only African-American, it's because they carry all the stories of the Caribbean, everybody that went to our shores. When we are mixing uh, colors, and we decide to take all the colors of a palette and mix them together, that action of inclusion, uh, the outcome is cinnamon color. How beautiful, canela. Nothing more beautiful than canela, by the way. What, and then what, what, that is the outcome of the inclusion. So all that is really what I talk about when I talk about my experience of a Dominican York. So my dang is double, that is plural. So I'm gonna leave it right there so we can keep talking. <laughs> Gracias, perfecto. I believe Rachel will ask next question. Okay, yeah. let me stop by sharing. Thank you. So my question I hinted at, um, I heard Sherezade and um, Sharina talking about the mixed class backgrounds of the and the diversity of yes. those who study together at um, El Altos de Chabon. And so I was hoping each of you could speak to um, either the makeup of your cohorts or the community you um, have been building with this network uh, and thinking about class and race. And I also am curious about how that diversity is reflected in who has access to the art world mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're navigating. Mm -hmm. So anyone want to start? They should know you want to start? Go for it. Okay. Uh, I think like it was, Chabon for me, it was a learning experience. <laughs> and I think Chabon, uh, this like created representation of not only the island, but as well like other students that have Dominican descent that like come from another countries and are part of this cohort can give a sense of history, can give a sense of class. And that it's sometimes like, to be like a early, to be like a young person over there dealing with that, you can definitely see access. Uh, and the discrepancies that, you know, like can like be inside of institutions because of power. So I suffer a little bit <laughs> because I'm from a hood, uh, from Santo Domingo, I'm from Villa Maria, uh, that is one of like the villas, Villa Maria, Villa Consuelo, Villa Francisca, and, uh, then like in Chabon, I was like with children of senators or like people from the town or from Abate 
that didn't have access to not even like the housing to be able to be working 24 hours over there or sometimes like needed to stay 24 hours with us uh, hosting them so to be able to study i think like it gave me a sense of social responsibility uh that i didn't have before uh because like sometimes like when we are out like for example in the hood i was all the time like kind of like yo i'm the poor person here help me no, like we have like the problem in the Dominican Republic or like this, the more responsibility with uh, different communities como la comunidad haitiana, which is, is huge. And being in La Romana, seeing every day all the Haitians like being carried away that were like working in Central Romana, not only gave me a sense of like, wait, this is happening all around. When I was in Santo Domingo, I was not seeing that every day. So it was like giving me a sense of like, why I want to be an artist is because I want to create change in society. It's because like, this is a vehicle to like start unpacking these discrepancies that I'm seeing every day. And uh, at the same time, understanding that, that my positionality as a person that like have Lebanese descent, that having that like that migration from my family that came in 1937 and that part that is like completely tied to the genocidio de los haitianos like make me understand at the same time that this is not only because I care it's because I have like as well history in that and I think like that continuing one my minute work. one minute okay I think like that continuing my working here understanding that like uh, a lot of, I was like very privileged on coming to Parsons with a Fulbright uh, a scholarship and with the help of Cherezade as well that we were doing fundraising for me to like be alive in New York City, like however is possible. Uh, but at the same time, I saw many of uh, African-Americans and Latinos that were in Parsons like paying from their own pocket and their families as well, like trying to like give education for them to like give access. So it was a lot of, yeah, understanding how like our education uh, is, is a machine in any way. Uh, and as well, like we need to like take the best of our, out of it because art has the power of being a communicate, uh, a connector that can talk and unpack difficult uh, problems in society through colors, through through different mediums and through different senses. Gracias. Um, you know, I think after we should talk about our experience, uh, um, um, you know, Dulcina, how we met and how we, this sisterhood is super important and that it will take up it takes it also to my experience with Julia, by the way. But like, like yes, I said a lot about the idea of diversity in, 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 in this first, second generation in Artos de Chabon. Not only it was like age, they were uh, in the first generation, they, they were older uh, students, people that were even older than Julia, who was the first Dominican descent uh, faculty member, by the way. And, and why? Because we were eager, thirsty of concept, of another experiences, the, of, of information beyond the Eurocentric. And incredible as it sounds, okay? Parsons had that. And the New York experience of somebody like Julia brought that. And I can't talk about that forever, so I wanna try to be, you know, kind of like focused. But let me tell you, I have here the program of my graduation. So I always say that the best way to understand history is to read between the lines and then apply observation. Uh, Julia Santos Salomon was the MC of my, uh, my graduation, by the way. And uh, we only had 38 graduates. It was a small school. That allowed us to be very tiny. That's why we are family. The moment you say you're from Chabon, what? Or your family, that's it. <laughs> no, that, that is this connection because there are certain things that nobody can teach you if you don't experience it in Chabon. Uh, it was intense, it was diverse. For example, we have in my group, only in my group, nine students, only in fine arts. Uh, Joseph Brown, who was from Trinidad. Cheresa de Garcia, from Santo Domingo. Uh, Lee Marrero, a Dominican York with the most charming accent 
okay? She spoke Spanish completely broken, but we all understood. And uh, Julio Matos, Dominican like me in from Santo Domingo, also the same kind of high Dominic, you know, high uh, middle class. Massimo Ortiz from Santiago, Claudio Pacheco from Santiago. Claudio Pacheco, Claudio Pacheco was found by Artos de Chabot admissions office when he was selling paintings in the streets. Uh, Jose Miguel Peña, the same, selling paintings in the streets. Sandra Ramirez came from uh, architecture, from the UNFO, also a uh, high middle class. Raimundo Wu, Chinese Dominican. <laughs> so the beauty, the beauty of only that would give you a university, okay? It's like, okay, do you need a, a, a degree? No, you don't, because with that. And this, this group of people, we will stay together the entire night doing homework. We will talk about life. Then when we came, we, we came to New York because the majority of that group got scholarships, you know, to New York, that became tighter because in New York, you know, the idea that, oh, you come from that class and I came from the other, yeah, yeah, did not make any sense because New York has that, you know, it really humbled you. And it's something that Dulcina and I, we talk a lot, you know, how we change our vision of this country when we came here. You know, so anyhow, um, the what happened in Artos de Chabon, you know, um, with the fact that we have this diversity of people of social backgrounds, but with talent, you know, and then when we go to this enormous country where we come as immigrants and then we are the others, and how we find a way to stay together, it is something that you know is a theory we have to study. Gracias. Hi, I was unmuting. Um, you know, this is a fascinating story. Um, in terms of identity, I arrived with short hair to the Dominican Republic, which was not acceptable for many, many years. I cut my hair off when I was 16. So when I came, they thought I was from somewhere else because of the way I looked. However, um, I came with an extraordinary intensity because I knew that these students had to survive as juniors in Parsons School of Design, which was highly competitive. And it was the year when you had to have all your concepts in place and all your skills in place. Some of the students did not know how to speak English properly. So we spent a lot of time preparing visual presentations that spoke for them. That first generation, we had students from El Campo who were given scholarships. And these were kids who barely got to Santo Domingo, let alone Alto de Chabon. Then we had children of senators whose parents send them food from Santo Domingo with a chauffeur. I mean, they were driving 75 miles to bring them their meals you know, or very wealthy people from Miami who lived here and there and had electricity all the time. And then the kids who couldn't afford the dorms in Chabon, who had to take the bus and then the bus to Casa de Campo and then the Casa de Campo bus up to Chabon in order to get to class and who had to sleep with some of the other students because they didn't have dorms. So the diversity was enormous, socially and financially. I had a really huge show in Chevron called Magia Verde, which was landscapes of the island. I was looking to see where I came from. And when I had the show in the gallery, usually they invite the villa owners and the echelons of Santo Domingo and Casa de Campo. But it was very important to me to invite the waiters from the restaurants, the taxi drivers, the, the people who were on the bus. And they came dressed up with their children in their Sunday best. And that brought me joy that it wasn't just the rich and famous who were showing up, that they could come 
and claim my work and my presence as theirs. And that made them happy. And it made me happier, but I was very aware of the- One divine. minute, one minute. Once everybody came to New York, as Chedasada said, it was like blood. We took care of each other. And I had been an artist that developed in New York without other artists, without other Latinx artists. This is a new, wonderful thing. When I was growing up, there was nothing like this. So the generation that I helped create in Chabon is the generation that I am now part of. And it's a very fascinating thing. And they're so excellent and I'm so proud of them. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Um, uh, we have approximately a little bit less than 20 minutes for the questions from the audience. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for being here. Muchas gracias a nuestras panelistas. Uh, so are we ready to take the questions? I believe so. If not, we are prepared more yeah. questions for you guys. We are, um, maybe people should raise their hand or let us know if they have a question, but I kind of want to take um, the organizer's privilege to ask Sherezade to comment on the thing she referenced around the mentorship and sisterhood across this particular group we have facilitated, we have curated. Really. You know what, Rachel? One thing that happened when I came to New York, it was that I first completely supported by that first generation that just came in. You know, they just have like nine months in New York. And when I came, it was like, hey, what do you need? Let me take you to Pearl Paint, when Pearl Paint was like the place to go. You know, and it was like, kind of like, we all got together. Uh, it was such a learning curve in many ways because also um, I, it was the first time in my life, actually, that I felt that I belonged to something, okay? Mm -hmm. And it was a super, you know, it's New York. New York is full of different people. <laughs> but it's, this Dominican group, it was very together and they were like this. We were like taking care of each other. And the most important thing was that. And then after that, it was like, if somebody came, we, you will take care of it. And we start getting these groups, you know, and getting, okay, you got it. For example, Jose Asiatico. We call him Rambo, Jose Asiatico, because he used to always be with his portfolio. And then it was the time that we know emails. It's on like, you will go in person to the interview with your work, okay? And then you will show it. And then if he thought your style would go, he would like beep you because we have beep, beeps you know, the beepers. And he would like beep you and he's like, oh my God, it's Hochi, it's a job, you have to get it, bam, 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 like that. And then that, that relationship is precious, you know? And then when I get that love, I gonna give that love back. So, you know, that, that was something that existed since my generation to the generation when I had the opportunity of being the liaison of the Artos de Chabon and Parsons. When, that's how I met Dulcina. Dulcina had an issue which was completely unfair. And we talk about that all the time. Now they're so proud of having Dulcina, of course. But, you know, my point is we are all, you know, with this idea of like, what do you need? What do you feel? I am here, you know? And it's not only about art, but it's about assistance. Mm -hmm. So I think that's to me, it is the most precious thing. And I have to say, I have, I, I have that same experience with Julia, who is being uh, somebody that is being with me since I had my babies, since I got married. You know, I, I mean, she's been part of my life, you know? So she's not only my colleague or my former professor, she is a mentor, she's a friend, she's a sister, you know? So um, I think that is to me the most important legacy you know that right now I can talk about the Artos, um, a, you know, project plus the fact that we can talk about how it defines, transform um, this the industry. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to like continue like share a oh, oh my, because <laughs> like um, it, I just like understanding like how many generations like passed like since Teresada came over till I came over like we have so many designers fashion designers like artists uh now like we have like art even uh, musicians that like work come 
to Chabon, like, and decided to like take another turn. Architects, like we have so many in New York City. So when I arrived in New York City, uh, there were a lot of like systemic racism that was like happening. Uh, and many of my friends, like Cheresala was like fundraising to like look for housing for me. Like many of the Chaboneros, like Gina Goico, Yoiri Menaya, Javier Maria. I was living like three months in one day, uh, in one house, two months in another one, three months in another. Eric Melendez, like uh, I have like Eduardo Velasquez, like Kaori Soñet helping me with the, the pronunciation. Like, cause like a, a lot of like system of racism and what was happening to me was like that I would have like a strong accent for so like the teacher said, thought that I was not smart enough to like deserve to be in Parsons. So this whole gener different generations of Chaboneros were like that lived through that. We're like, no, like we are going to like build this structure. Like <laughs> there were people that like were like living their, um, Sus trabajos, they work in garment district at 5.30 and like meeting with me in like 12 and in, in Los Edificios de Parson to like check my writing papers, to like check like how they can like support me and like embrace this like sisterhood, brotherhood, like this whole family energy to for me to success. So I, I think the, to like understand this relationship of like Altos de Chabón, with uh, Parsons is a whole pipeline that create, um, we can like maybe say that it's like a map, like a way of mapping resilience in the Dominica York community, mm -hmm. uh, if I can say. It's a whole machinery of saying like, we can use this uh, to support each other in different ways, not only like financially, as well as even like mental health. Okay. And, and if I may interject for a minute, because you just gave me a great segue to the Dominican York aspect, right? And this is something that I spoke with Cheresade in some ways in our in our in our and in our interview. But um, in some of the pre-recorded interviews, some of you did did reflect upon the Dominican York subjectivity because you just spoke about Dominican York and then it click and the role this identity plays in your work and, and as women chaboneras because Cheresada and I had a conversation about Dominican Yorkness and also being women artists, women chaboneras, no? So my question then to you, if you could um, answer, if you could just tell us is what would you kind of expand and tell us what the Dominican your subjectivity and the role that this identity plays in your work? Um, and also what are the, what, what is the role of those intergenerational shifts you see in assuming this identity, both in your work and self-identification, because I'm assuming that the three generations have a very particular way of assuming or self-identifying or being attached to the Dominican York identity and tag, right? And um, just so that you know, I'm not timing anyone anymore. We still have 15 minutes, so feel free to say as much as you'd like. Free. <laughs> You know what I am thinking? I, I, I want to talk a little bit about Julia and how I perceived Julia when I was still a student. So I have to say, Julia, I think you should talk a little bit about your experience of being double because you are the first one. You are the, the real Dominican York. <laughs> Thank you, Cheresale. Um, I came to Chamon uh, at age 25. And I went through a series of very long interviews, which ended with the Dean of Parsons at the time, who sat across from me and said, look, you have a great life in New York. I mean, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that. Why do you want to go there? And I had to look at this man in the face and say, because those are my people. And this is my passion. And I want to pass my passion unto my people. I had to say that to him. And he said, okay, go. <laughs> you know? So what happens? I get to Chavon. I've lived in New York. 
I went to the Rhode Island School of Design. I experienced racism. I experienced being the person with the scholarship. I worked a lot. And I knew that what I had in my heart and what I lived in the United States and in the Dominican Republic was going to create a unique relationship with these students. What Sherezada is telling you is that every Chabonera that graduates from there is a great grandchild of mine. Do you understand? I poured everything I knew about New York into them. The discipline that was required for them to succeed in New York, in the competition that I knew was waiting for them, in the racism that I knew was waiting for them because I lived it. So I knew what degree of intensity and passion I needed to give them. They were all talented, the most brilliant bunch of people and raw, but they were not aware of what was waiting for them in New York. So my having one foot here and one foot there helped me. Now I taught at Parsons School of Design in their fashion department mm -hmm. from 1989 to 2004 when I got tired of commuting. <laughs> All of the students that were coming through Chabon, they would show them to me. And they say, I don't know about this one. I said, that's a good one. You keep that person. So in the beginning, the process of awarding scholarships was something I was involved with very intimately. And in fighting for these kids, the way Sherezade for, for Dulcina. So being already in Parsons when they were heading in allowed for a bridge. And that's why I know Cherisana's children. I have relationships with them. Every single Chabonero that went through my hands, I have a relationship with. Because we have to build something together with each other's strength. Those of you that came when I was no longer there, you are experiencing what it took to make Chabon successful. Not just in New York, but here, what did you need to survive? And I want to add to that, how that happened and it was successful. Um, before I got my scholarship, okay? And I, I knew that I was coming to New York and I was having my, my food ride and all that. Um, I, I, okay. The, you know, you, I want to say something, and um, then because sometimes, because we are from Alto de Chabon, and Dulcina knows this, and many of the people that we know that are Chaboneros also know this, we can be very harsh with Chabon, because we care, so we cannot forgive anything that we think is stupid, <laughs> so because we, we love it, but so the first years of Chabon, especially the, the five first years, were like when you feel that you're a pioneer, you are changing the planet and you feel that you're responsible. So Julia being the only one that was um, Dominican descent, she felt responsibility. And, and uh, when Charles Blue don't pass away way too soon, even before the, the school was founded, you know, his vision really deluded, you know? And, uh, but people like Julia uh, was, you know, assertive enough to say to Stephen Kaplan, that was the dean at the time, I mean, the director with, uh, between Parsons and, and, and Santo Domingo, to say, you know what, we need to bring people like Antonio Lopez. We need to, to bring us a JC Suarez, people that are iconic New Yorkers, but they are Latinos. Yeah. So in a way, the bridge was starting to build before we got to New York. Yes. So when we got to New York, my first job was with Antonio Lopez, who was a star. You know, and who I met to the uh, classes that he gave in Artos, but it was to Julia, you know. So, so what I am saying is like, everything is about community. Everything is about building of community. You know, it's, it's funny, it's the cheapest way to build things, but we take it for granted, you know. And, and, and like that, we still do it. 
for example, Ducina knows it. The moment she came to New York, I started like, hey, you have to call Rogelio Velasco. You have to call Jolive. You have to call this person. Why? Because these people are in business. <laughs> and these people are your people, you know? So it's all about these, these uh, connections and pulling the dots and also to be proud of understanding that it's okay to be double. It's okay to be Dominican and to be cosmopolitan and New Yorker. It's okay. As a matter of fact, as Caribbean that we are, you know, the majority of us, you know, that somehow got to the Caribbean, I don't know how, you know, we have so many people in this skin. So we can take it, we can own it. We can even, we don't have to justify it, you know? So it's all about this idea of building of community. And I thought it was super important. And in, in my opinion, it's still being the, the, the most important element of the Shabon. Because in, in, in my case, for example, the case, my relationship with Ursina, with Ernesto Rivera, with, uh, with oh my God, I mean, so many, I, I, I am forgetting, with Gina, with uh, Elia Slava, I mean, I have so many. It is the fact that we can discuss concept. We can discuss without, uh, you know, getting, you know, like, oh, I am a professor and, you know, I am the last generation, I am older. No, it is all about this idea. We want to share our experiences. We want to be part of these changes. We want to change the world, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that is something key and it's gonna keep you young, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I wanna <laughs> <push. laughs> think it's you like, before, Oh, sorry, Rachel. Before, like, we can, I, I just, I like, wanted to, like, make a comment because, like, I, Rachel always like asked me this and wanted to like continue with share Sada because like Dominican York, like identity. I think like we need to like talk about like Dominican York identity and philosophy of being. Because like I live in Baltimore right now, but I continue like feeling that I am a Dominican York and I assume myself as a Dominican York, even when I was like born and raised in the island. Uh, because it's this sense of community, this like a way of like embracing Spanglish is this way of like having this aesthetic that is like very free. I think like uh, with Sherezade and with Josefina as well, like just like wanted to like make a comment. Coming to the Dominican your community because of Parsons, like open it up not only to experience like a uh, creative work of Dominican York communities of people that were around Parsons and Chapo. Josefina Baez, Nicolás Dumit Esteves, like El Mismo Jolivet. Like I was like exposed to so many of them that were already like working with Cheresa, that were working with, uh, with Julia that expanded my way of seeing art and seeing literature like my struggle like with language when I transition it will not be possible I will not be in the states if I couldn't like find in Josefina Baez text in Dominicanish in Bliss like in um in La Levente like a, a sanctuary like this is part of our identity. This is struggle make us create. This is struggle of like being in between make us work, like, like allow us to create worlds. And uh, I think like the sense of like being como dijo Cheresade, when I arrived, like she was like, work, like llama Rogelio, call Nicolás, call Jolive. I work for uh, Moses Rose. I work with Sherezade, I work for Nicolas Dumit Esteves, I work for like Josefina Baez. I did a show on Moses Rose and all the graphics that he was doing to talk about Dominican York identity, even though he was not a Chabonero. So I think, and now I work at Smithsonian, like uh, creating um, an archive about like the impact of like the 9-11 attacks in the Latinx, the Latinx communities and COVID. And when it does of these things is like the participation that Cheresade did uh, in, in the church, um, in the Greenwood Cemetery, creating spaces that could like help the Latinx community, not only the Dominican Jordan, not only the Parsons community, but like the Latinx community to cope with this, that like the New York City at large 
it's thriving. So I think like it is important to understand how like from micro to macro, this like, this like, um, how can I say, this career and this philosophy of creating community that like the Dominica Jork community gave us is impacting not only the Dominica Jork community, but the Latinx community at large and other immigrants community in New York City. I really appreciate that, Dulcina, and your mention of this, like thinking in terms of archiving, because that was a question for me. And that is also a conversation happening in the chat is like, how do we visualize all of these connections and influences? Where do they get archived? Where are your archives of these moments? And how do we value that? And I know we have just five minutes left. And Beth Manley had a question as a historian, um, very engaged. Beth, do you want to chime in? With your yeah, question. apologies for my bad light here. It's nighttime in New Orleans. Um, uh, thank you so much. This panel was fabulous and it was just great to hear all your voices. And I really have to say, you know, this idea of community. Um, when I went to Santo Domingo in 2004 to do my research, I fell in with a group of artists and many of them Chabanero. And it was, you know, reciprocally welcoming for someone whose Spanish was awful and continues to be not great. Um, and someone who, you know, was in a new place, but trying to learn that the community was so supportive. And I learned two things. Um, one is that I was able to say something about art, which I was, you know, didn't think I had the brain to do. Um, all of a sudden I, I felt, you know, empowered to kind of think about art and, and be engaged with it. But I was also so impacted by the connections with history, right? And I could see it in all of this art. All of and them, all, everything, yes. So, so present. I mean, maybe in part because I was so connected to that history and so passionate about it. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you all was, you know, for me, the, the activism of artists in the 60s in the Dominican Republic is so powerful and so undocumented and something that I'm very interested in exploring more. Um, how did that generation for all of you in different ways, and, and, you know, obviously this question should be phrased differently for each of you, but how yes. do you connect with that activism, particularly like the Declaration of Artists in 1965 and um, the kind of work that was happening then? I'm just really interested in how you connect to that. And I, I think I could start, Elizabeth, and thank you for that question. It is, you are so right. Um, Three of us, we are, our, our work is embedded in history. Um, I do come from a very socialist background family. <laughs> my family, uh, my mother and my father were both very uh, part of the movement. Um, 14 de Junio was a very, very important one in the uh, Civil War. And, and that definitely uh, shaped my views of many things. But I also wanna say that during that time of like when we came here, like we have what we call chaboneros um, by just by uh, honorary chaboneros. People like Josefina Weiss, like Moses Ross, Herman Perez, Ana Ophelia Rodriguez, Sandra Fonoma. I mean, they were people that became part of this new movement, okay? And I wanna make sure this is, this is part of, because we have a, a severe, Elizabeth, a severe, you know, lack of documentation. We have people like uh, Doña Ada Barcastle, who is now 90 years old. She, she's like Alfreda Calvo, she doesn't have her arm, but she paints, she's 90, okay, 90. And she paints this enormous painting. We are the only people that know her really, because the lack of documentation is severe and is all about maestros, male masters, okay? Even though historically, historically, the history of, 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 of our art is from Celeste Bossi Hill, a woman, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Doña Ada Balcácer, and all of us women <laughs> that have defined, really defined arts of the country. You know, and Doña Ada Balcácer was with Silvano Loda, one of the painters that started doing those murals doing the occupation of the North Americans in 1965. So my point is, yes, there is a lot of work to do. And I think we're gonna need a lot of sisterhood and lots of your help of our historians. So it's a collaboration. <laughs> Yeah, I just like, wanted to like continue in it, like making like that point of like the, the revolution. 
something important about this is this revolution, 1965, it was not possible without the help of our Haitian intellectuals that were connected with all of our uh, the artists over there. There is a book, a uh, publication called Pueblo Sangre y Canto that was made by the uh, by a publication de Frente Cultural that it was a, a poem, like a series of poems con René de Risco, eh, también que te, tenía un poema bellísimo de, um, give me one second, que le iba, de Juan José Ayuso that was talking about Jack View and the relationship that, that the family of the Jack View had with all the intellectuals that were like putting together these words that were reinforcing the sense of like belonging que tenía el pueblo that had the Dominican, that was lacking in, as a whole in the Dominican like, population after the Trujillato. So I think like that sense of like, how can I say, of embracing freedom in community, in between the Haitian and Dominican community was lost. I never knew about that till my, my mother, uh, and I am very interested in this, I'm all the time digging in this, but I didn't know about this till my mother for my birthday, like woke me up con un uh, poema de Juan Jose Ayuso uh, for my birthday talking about like this, image of like Jack View leading the population, leading the, the people like trying to like liberate from this like US invasion. So it is a struggle for us to be working when we don't know our history. I think like this, I, uh, I stopped like creating work maybe after Orlando, after like this like very difficult situation that it was like not publicized and it was like not necessary like, you know, uh, embraced by the state as a matter of genocide against the queer community uh, for immigrants in the US. So I stopped that and I entered the Smithsonian to work uh, in a field that was like trying to archive Mm -hmm. all the work that the Latinx communities were doing in this country. So I think like it is a double side work because like a lot of things that I'm learning over there, I'm all the, I'm all the time in contact with people in the Dominican Republic as well that are trying to like create more visibility about the work that the Haitian community is doing over there as well as like revolutionaries that are talking about as well like gender equity and visibilization of Haitian rights, Haitian Dominican Haitian rights in the island. I know we really uh, have pushed pushed you all through the kind of academic structure of the conference panel, and you've done a really great job of dropping so much knowledge. Uh, Julia, I don't know if you wanted to try to get in a few words on that comment. We, I know we've gone past time, but I, I'm hoping that we will build in some structures to just get this conversation going in the years ahead. We have lots of ideas generated here. Well, I'm very excited about history, about paying attention to what we're seeing here and what it, that it actually exists and the ties. Uh, I wanted to respond to the question about 1965. I was a seven year old child and I did not have relationships, but I did experience the war that will never leave me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother grew up with Guillo Perez. I didn't know who he was, but he was instrumental in getting me my first solo show in the Dominican Republic, which consequently introduced me to all the people who were organizing the school before it was built, and then got me to Chabon. So there was this odd connection, but I didn't realize how male oriented that was, and even with Guillo, who knew my family, it was so dense. And I'm like, oh, how, how does one live with this? You know, so 
I was grateful to him, but I couldn't deal with it mm -hmm. as a female artist in the Dominican Republic, trying to be who I was. So I just wanted to say those two things mm -hmm. and to emphasize the need to become organized, to become documented, to be recorded, to be archived, because that's our history. That's how we change it. We can't be disorganized and have all this stuff happening. We have been, except for the Chavon community, which is this nucleus that holds all this information, but there's so much. And yes, we need our archives. And yes, we need to tell it like it is. You know, I have my Chavon ID card in the Dominican Studies <laughs> Archive at CUNY. Mm -hmm. Why? Because somebody told me I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that I was not physically there. And I'm like, that's why history and documentation is important because all I needed to do was take it out and say, here we are. Mm -hmm. You understand? Somebody yeah. can say, none of this happened. It's not important. That's right. So we need scholars. We need the historians. We need the writers. We need the archivists. We need to make this real because yeah. it's important. Well, we're all here. of us. I mean, oh, we're here and we're passionate about this. And juicy information. I have a juicy information. I want to kind of like wrap for wrapping up. Yeah, so we can get to okay. the, and the first Dominica York exhibition, like real, like thinking about that in that direction, was Dominica Cosas Dominica Caras, curated by Josefina Weiss. And guess what? It was in Henry Street Settlement. Mm -hmm. And Henry Street Settlement is the first cultural hub of New York City after the Ellis Island Exodus people. Imagine, this is perfect. We are the new Americans. So I, you know, we need to start really, you know, making this like official. Like, look, this is a catalog, for the, by the way, I have a catalog of that, by the way. Because, you know, don't, you know, uh, Josefina gets very crazy with this, but it is important. <laughs> it is important, <laughs> you know. But it was a group of people, and I exhibited there with my dear Julia. Remember Julia? Jose Asiatico, Moses Rose. It was, they were in my sister Liliana Emilia, Pilar Gonzalez, also from Artos. So my point here, we do have all the material. We just have to organize ourselves, like Julia says. Okay, well, we have some ideas about that. Y para ese, we, have to <laughs> we are excited to do that and continue to broaden the conversation. And thank you so much for everybody who joined us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for all your generosity. It thank was wonderful. You. We are very excited to continue with this project. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be in, for we'll be in touch. Gracias. Gracias a ustedes. Gracias. Bye. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.